Welcome to the MSDW Podcast. I'm Jason Gumpert, editor at msdynamicsworld.com. On this episode, I welcome back Steve Mordu. He's a Microsoft MVP, a blogger, and he runs ForceWorks Global. Steve recently spoke with Microsoft's Charles Lamana, who previously led Power Platform and now leads the entire Microsoft Business Applications Group. Steve and I discuss some of the points from that conversation, including product priorities, leadership styles, and customer trends. We also chat about some of the channel findings from my earlier podcast episode with the team from Partner Economics. Steve tells us about some of the updates at his firm and how they might align with some of the broader trends in the Microsoft Marketplace. All right. Hey, Steve. Welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for joining me. Jason, good to be here. Been a while. It has. Um, I, I didn't actually do a scientific uh, sort of examination, but I think you're the, I think you're the most frequent um, uh, guest at now at this point on the podcast. I have to go back and count it, but yeah, like uh, certainly several and great to have you back. Great, great. And uh, I thought this was a, really a perfect time to, to reconnect on here. Um, you just had a nice uh, interview with Charles Lamana of Microsoft, and I read it, or I actually did, yeah, I read it. I didn't listen to it, um, and and got got some interesting points from it. And I thought, hey, maybe we could uh, sort of chat about some of the things that uh, that he revealed and that you asked him about, and even some of the things that you um, you brought up, sort of from your side and your experiences as a partner. Um, yeah, sure. So yeah, that's my, that was my fourth uh, interview with Charles over several years mm-hmm. and uh it was kind of interesting i myself went back and listened to them in order uh just you know kind of how he has evolved with the platform and uh yeah it's kind of interesting i'd say if anybody's interested in charles and his evolution since he's now leading business applications uh it's, it's an interesting listen to go back and see how he's evolved over four episodes and five years i i admit i did not do that um but I have seen them all or, and listened to them all, or listened to and or read them all, because you post transcripts along with the um, along with the interviews, uh, along with the audio. And um, I, my my impression, though, uh, just just looking at this last one and thinking back to the others, is that uh, pretty consistent um, over over time. Not a lot of you know certain. There have been times in the past, and maybe you alluded to this in um, in this most recent conversation you had with him. But there have been some hard pivots at Microsoft at different times in in in. You know, in its existence with business applications, especially um, hard pivots in, in the CRM space, um, you know, even to some extent with ERP. But I don't feel like he's really had to do that, um, whether he was working for James Phillips or now on, on his own. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that uh, business applications was, you know, just something on the back burner for Microsoft for the longest time until uh, really such it took over. And, and he had a background in business applications. And, and he's the one, I think, who decided to elevate business applications to the same level of, you know, Azure and, and uh, Microsoft 365 and their other products. He's the first, you know, the first one to actually even consider that. And as part of that, you know, I think he kind of looked at, uh, at the group he had running it and said, yeah, you're not going to get me there. And, uh, you know, pulled Phillips over from uh, Power BI because he was killing it in Power BI. And let him, uh, you know, take that thing to the next level. And, you know, James brought in a bunch of young, young folks, uh, and really kind of gave them some rope, uh, to go and, and, and take this thing to the next level. And, and, uh, you know, they really, they really have changed completely, uh, you know, the whole complexion of dynamics and the whole power platform as we knew it before into something completely different. And I fully expect Charles to continue that. Yeah, it, it, I got the sense that he does really tend uh, or intend, intend to to continue on, um, sort of where where Phillips has left off. That they they seemed to work well together. Um, was that your yeah, impression? Yeah. yeah, no, they were a good team. They, the whole group of them were a good team. They're all you know they're all friends. They all go out to dinner. They all hang out. They were they were a good group together. Uh, the one that, the, you know, that shows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. The the one challenge i see for for uh lamana perhaps and he, i think he handled it fairly well like with, with talking to you was you know talking about you know business application pre-made pre-built dynamics business applications with the same amount of enthusiasm that he talks about citizen developers and um and you know apps and automation you know creating them through the power platform i think that's i think so far he's, he's doing okay on that um and i don't know how deep he'll ever have to really go because he's not a Dynamics product manager. No, you know, I mean, he, he's kind of seesawed a little bit 
over the years on some of that because, uh, you know, when he was brought into the team, he wasn't brought in to manage a first party product. Um, he, he was brought in really around that, that platform underneath and separating it and building the power platform. I remember talking to James Phillips at some event a while back and a asked him about the power platform and dynamics and does he see a day when it takes over and he said, he told me, make no mistake, you know, Dynamics 365 pays the rent and it'll be quite some time before that changes. But it wasn't really in, in Charles' responsibility. He was, he was focused on the platform, the citizen application platform. But now, um, in, in, in the past couple of years, even, I've heard him talking more about the first party apps. And now, of course, he's responsible. So he's the one who's got to get the rent covered. And I guess today, Dynamics 365 is still, you know, the primary thing doing that. So I think we'll, he continues to talk about citizen developer, but, uh, you know, he's also talking about those first party apps because uh, they really need those to, to keep this thing going. One of the f first things I noted to, noted down just in terms of interesting points that he made uh, talking to you was that um, that he said they have great data about who adopts Power Platform, uh, about users who adopt Power Platform are more likely to adopt Dynamics in the next year or two. Um, interesting um, interesting finding, uh, I, not necessarily obvious to me. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, dynamic. I mean, a Power Platform is, is like we talked about in the interviews. I mean, it's it's actually a product that can scale to any mm -hmm. company, any size globally where dynamics never could get there just because, you know, it's fairly specific and it was, you know, fairly ex relatively expensive compared to uh, platform solutions. So now suddenly they've got this, you know, enormous uh, population of users of the power platform. Uh, I was a little surprised also that so many of those, uh, you know, moved from that to dynamics because you know, a lot of these, applications they're building or applications that never would have been built before because they were never going to, you know, spring for the money, uh, you know, for something else. And, uh, but I don't know, maybe it's a little addictive, right? You get a little bit of that, that power platform, uh, addiction. I mean, we see that with customers all the time. They, they, they definitely get addicted to what they're able to do with the platform. Uh, mm -hmm. but you know, dynamics is not really a, you know, the same. I mean, Dynamics is a built application. I mean, you can customize and extend it, but you got to have that need. If you've built some power app to manage your, you know, your your check in, check out of your laptops or something, you don't jump from there to oh, I need Dynamics three sixty five. So there must be a, some other use cases that he's he's talking about that that have that propensity. Yeah, that does that. That uh, I hear what you're saying there. It, it does make me think also that maybe people get the idea of building all their own business applications on, on Power Platform, and then they reach the conclusion that a, a pre-built uh, pre apps could serve serve them better and be more you know robust, supportable, um, all, all that, cheaper in the long run, whether it's a Dynamics app or something like what, um, what your firm creates, right, which is it's an application built or applications built atop the Power Platform. Yeah, we fully expected that dynamic and actually talked to Microsoft in the earlier days about that, that potential that people would start with rapid start CRM, uh, you know, a simpler CRM on Dataverse and that uh, their next logical step would be to, you know, upgrade, if you will, quote unquote, to the first party apps. Um, but we haven't really seen that happen um, at all. Um, and I think the reason is that, you know, people aren't, I mean, they're looking for a business solution to solve their problems, whether they start with Dynamics, start with Rapid Start, start with a platform, wherever they start, they're really looking to solve a problem. And, you know, Dynamics uh, has a lot of things in it that a lot of people don't need. And, it, you know, so most customers are going to have to customize whatever they get to really fit their needs. But I think once they've done that customizing, you know, they, it's solving their needs. So they, they've kind of lost some motivation to move to something else when they already have their need being solved by whatever it is. Um, so we haven't seen people move from rapid start to dynamics like I originally thought they would and had originally told Microsoft I had planned that they would. Um, you know, it just didn't, it just didn't end up happening. You know, people, they do their customizations on whatever, get it solving their problems and they're, they're happy there. They don't, they don't see a need, uh, always to make a move. 
I, that's also, we, we're, we're also targeting two different customers, right? I mean, Microsoft is really targeting the big, the big customers with big needs. And we're targeting the, you know, mid-size and smaller customers with simpler needs. So when they look up at Dynamics from Rapid Start or the platform, wherever they're working on, they're seeing a lot of stuff that they think, yeah, that's cool stuff for a big company, but we're not a big company. And he seems content with that. I mean, he identified that even in the call. You know, they're targeting, even like just with their field service, you know, he said they're targeting like users with thousands of technicians. Well, you know, a company that's got 20 field service technicians is not going to, is not going to consider something like that. So Yeah, and, and I think a statement like what, what Charles made about more likely to buy Dynamics, I mean, that's still, that could still be within a fairly, you know, a fairly limited set, uh, more likely to buy Dynamics, but but still, I mean, you look at all the users of Power Platforms, it could still be a very small, small amount. But I could certainly see that yeah. having an influence. You get, you, you, you build faith in Microsoft's technology stack, you build faith in your partner working with Microsoft te- technology very close to dynamics it certainly makes sense that then when you go to look for an enterprise application you look right next door at dynamics not at um oracle or salesforce especially as they advance you know especially as they advance their skills you know most people their introduction to the power platform is the seated power apps capabilities that come with their microsoft license so they've got access to something that's in the power platform but you know, what they've got access to really is building Canvas apps. Um, and I think for a lot of people, they think that's what Power Platform is, Canvas apps. They don't really realize yeah. because, you know, because it requires a different license to get over into the Dataverse, model-driven apps. And essentially, Dynamics is a great big, you know, model-driven app. And I think a lot of people just haven't made that connection yet. But the ones that do, you know, now they're building, you know, a model-driven app, which is the same as Dynamics as a model-driven app. And so maybe that jump is a little easier because they're very familiar. You know, they open up a Dynamics trial and they're looking at the same thing they've been working on. Yeah, uh, and, so. and maybe a, a related product uh, item that, that came up uh, fr- from, again, from, from Charles there was his mention that, that his team uh, built Viva Sales, which was just revealed a couple, three weeks, a few weeks ago anyway. Um, interesting product, one that I really haven't reached a conclusion on yet about how likely it is to to really succeed. But boy, I think it has some very interesting ideas and, and it really has, a, I mean, it has the potential to succeed um, in, in sort of doing some of what we talked about. And this is my view, obviously. Um, you know, you have Power Platform, you have Dynamics products, you have other CRMs, other enterprise data built in Microsoft. If, if it could really lock companies into <laughs> into using all those systems over the long term by by helping them make sense of it, hey, it could, it could uh, work for some segment. I don't know if it's just enterprise or what, but um, interesting. I, I thought it was interesting the Power Platform or that the Biz Apps team developed that. Um, I did not know that know it before I read it that on your site, and uh, uh, I was a little surprised. You know, I, I uh, I'm probably batting about fifty fifty on mm-hmm. future predictions. That's really good. <laughs> you know, but uh, if I were making one here, uh, you know, without any knowledge, nobody said anything about it. I think I think this is really the beginning of. Uh, of this motion of kind of wiring all these pieces together. Um, and I think, you know, we're going to see Viva sales. I think we're going to see Viva service. I think we're going to see Viva. I think we're going to see Viva everywhere. I think this is, uh, this is the nose under the tent of, uh, let's see how we can get all these things truly talking to each other, uh, at a, at a, at an even higher level than they do today, which isn't bad. I think it's, they talk to each other better than anything else does, but, you know, as a as a user, you can still see some some gaps, and I think this Viva Sales is going to close some of those gaps. Um, I thought it was interesting his point about you know because I was thinking about myself, you know, that what all of my phone calls are are recorded and they're all being transcribed, and you know, it's a convenience to make notes. And I guess it doesn't bother me because I'm not an employee, <laughs> but but I could see it. I could see it potentially bother some employees, so he knows they've got to kind of address some of that that stuff, but. You know, it's, it's, when you look at the trajectory, it's the same that they've been on. It is, this is like the next logical thing for them to do would be something like Viva sales. And like I say, I fully expect once they shake that out, uh, we're going to see Viva service. We're going to see Viva fields or Viva everything. It's just going to be that extra layer now on top of the business application. Yeah. Is it the last one? I mean, is it, is it the keystone that, that Microsoft really hangs in there with and, um, 
and and makes it that thing both for the role like you said for sales for like role based solutions and for horizontal employee uh, services. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see. I think if you, I have a little trouble sometimes wrapping my head around it, but I think the idea of it as a companion across sort of a, a big sort of overall Microsoft investment for these roles, I could. I can see it. Yeah, I think it has it has potential. Um, you know, every uh, every time I've interviewed Charles, I've always asked him about you know certain things. You know, one is you know what's the exciting things coming, and also you know what are the things that people haven't taken advantage of that you thought they would or should. You know, that isn't getting traction that it really deserves. And his answers to both of those things have always been uh, followed by success in those areas. Hmm. So. You know, kind of looking at that trajectory of the history of my conversations, you know, when, he, when he's excited about Viva Sales, uh, that tells me that there's going to be a lot of investment, a lot of effort made there. Because most of the things he's been excited about in the past were followed by massive investment and, and advancement. So I don't, I definitely don't think they're just sticking a toe in the water with it. I think they, I, mean, I think they just see that as, as, a, as mm-hmm. something. Do you huge. remember what any of the past ones had been? Off the top of my head, no, mm-hmm. but I, I, I just I remember when I was listening back through the podcast of asking those questions, I remember making a note in my head that, yep, that turned uh-huh. into something. Yep, that turned into something. So the only one that hasn't, in my mind, was the uh, that effort to connect all of these other applications. What was that called? There was, a, there was a motion out there, I don't recall it right now, about building like a data model that oh, yeah. across the SAP um, and the open required everybody's participation. Open data, and that one he seemed, to, he seemed to have made a big bet on, but I haven't, I haven't really seen or heard anything more about that recently. So that might be one that they, but you know, also ideas have a have a lifespan, right? I mean, they today based on where we are, you can have an idea that uh, you know six months from now doesn't make near as much sense as it does at that time. We just came through all that COVID stuff. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that made sense then. Now that we're coming out of it, you know, some of those things might be getting shelved. You know, they don't make as much sense now. The economy's in a different position, so it kind of changes. You know, what made sense maybe now it doesn't make as much sense. Yeah, yeah, and 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 in this in this most recent interview, I think that the the thing he pointed to in addition to Viva Sales was conversation intelligence, which you kind of mentioned earlier. Um, so that's that's the one to sort of watch that he's, he, he's got a lot of, uh, he thinks has a lot of promise is working well, but just not, not being taken up as much yet. I think those are related. I mean, I think conversation intelligence might've been the spark of what led to this concept of Viva sales. Cause it, it heavily uses that, you know, you build some, something cool like conversation intelligence is not getting the uptick and you think, okay, what would be a cool use for this? And, uh, you know, he didn't say, but I, it, it, in my mind, the uh, sales seems like a good use for that to get it out there, get it exposed, uh, and have people understand what it is. So it could be that that uh, this whole be the sales thing originated from we need to get some traction with conversational intelligence, but now it's I think it's mm. taken on its own. Thing. Yeah, one of my that makes sense. My, one of my sort of working hypotheses earlier had been they'd been looking for a way to do this for a while, and I think Viva, the Viva brand maybe gave them sort of a an overarching yeah, brand slash approach that that could put you know outlook, you know, exchange and CRM and 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 the rest of the Microsoft Graph data and documents and you know conversation from Teams and all these things sort of sort of in, in one umbrella and uh, and yeah and adding in like you said conversation intelligence that they now have to 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 throw into that mix to enrich it more yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny at the at the last uh, pack meeting, you know, they they do these roundtables on products, and one of them they were going to be doing was on Viva sales. And my experience with Viva right now is this annoying thing <laughs> in my inbox. Yeah. Uh, so so I you know they they pre-select who's going to be on these roundtables, and I was selected to be on that roundtable, but I really didn't want to do that because I thought you know this Viva this is an annoying tool in my box. I'm not really that interested, so I I just went to a different one uh but <laughs> right afterwards i started hearing about what it was so it seems to have less in common with what we know of as viva today uh, 
and and more of maybe just sharing mm. a name. Yeah, perhaps. The other um, the other thing that that BizApp's team is now sort of uh, at least partly engaged in is is nuance R and D. So the big nuance acquisition from last year, um, which doesn't really, to my perception, hasn't really doesn't really touch the rest of the biz apps at all. Um, but it seemed like Charles was saying that, you know, there's the chance that some of their more interesting technology could start to blend in to some extent anyway, with, with more of the sort of traditional D365 customer service scenarios, perhaps, um, or at least, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to remember, I mean, Char Charles now has responsibility for the, you know, the P and L's of those, of those first party apps, but he didn't before. Um, he, he, so he's kind of a, a platform guy at heart. So his, his first thought will be platform, but then I think there's probably this, wait a minute, I'm in charge now. I need to make sure that first party is doing what it needs to do too. But uh, I don't think he's going to be able to shake his you know roots in the platform and, and things at the platform level. I, I, I sure hope not because, you know, for a company like ours, you know, we need some of those capabilities that they, bring the first party to eventually come to platform, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, you know, Viva sales is not at the platform yet, but you know, as you said, it would be, I'm calling it four <laughs> months. <laughs> see if, let's see if it is, but I get it that they got to shake it out in, in, you know, in, in some, some real world scenarios before they bring it there. Um, but he's, he's still, I think a platform guy at heart. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, it, when it comes to a big expensive acquisition like that, um, It'll be interesting to see how well he sort of uh, is engaged in it, how much he gets engaged, how much he, I don't know how much he, he or anyone on the BizApp side was engaged in the decision to to acquire Nuance. They they go, this seems like some of the, their key capabilities, a really strategic value of that, of that company sits alongside, walks in parallel to what maybe a Microsoft a D365 customer service or CE suite does but really really playing a different game um going after different kinds of of clients serving very specific scenarios in in, in call centers and con you know contact centers and um and, and customer service scenarios that i don't know if it even competes you know with with what microsoft typically offers and and that seems like an executive challenge for executives who are who are then asked to uh to manage it so that's just one more yeah i think one more executive sort of level challenge for him you know, the, their history, at least on the business application side, before Phillips of acquisitions isn't very good. Uh, yeah, they, they really bought some terrible things and ended up, you know, throwing a lot of money away. But their history since Phillips joined, they seem to have gotten much more methodical about their acquisition strategy. They've still made plenty. Uh, but I don't know if, uh, of any that I'm aware of that they that they've made during his tenure that got shelved. So they've, they've, they've been much more thoughtful about what they buy. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm sure Charles is probably engaged in all those conversations, but um, now he's going to be the decision maker on, on potentially some of these future acquisitions for the business applications group, or at least which ones to promote up for acquisition to whoever has a checkbook. Uh, be curious to see how he handles that. But, you know, he, his company was acquired itself, I mean, to, by Microsoft. So he, he definitely understands growth through acquisition and, and build it versus buy it. And that I think they've gotten much smarter with their acquisition strategy. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. Um, so even, even if they announce some acquisition, and I, my first thought is I don't get it, um, I, I'm still pretty confident that they've got a plan. You know? <laughs> Whereas before, I wasn't confident at all that they had any plan for buying. Something, yeah, you know? but they, yeah, they, they in, the, in the past, it, it seemed like acquisitions were meant to sort of re, like I said at the beginning, kind of pivot the entire you know, product line. Uh, it, it was sort of why they were buying something. It was, this is going to change the product line. This is going to, you know, reshape what we, what we offer. And now it's, that's not really what Phillips was, was uh, all about. You know, in one of my earlier chats with him, which I was listening to, we talked about how they, they kind of moved off their myopic focus on Salesforce. Uh, and, and I won't say they're, they ignore Salesforce, but you know, they're, they're not, they're not steering business applications by Salesforce and what it does. You know, they're kind of going their own way, doing their own stuff, and Salesforce is Salesforce. And I think this is just a, more of the same. You know, they're they're not 
whereas before the acquisitions, I think we're very focused on, you know, they couldn't get Salesforce out of the laser site. And everything they tried to buy or do was was aiming at trying to, you know, chip away at that mountain. And uh, I, think, I think starting with Phillips coming in, they pretty much just said, well, you know, Salesforce, Salesforce, so what? Let's go do our thing. And uh, Charles definitely has that mentality. Um, and it's been, I think it's been a smart move to stop focusing on, you know, one great big competitor and instead just do what you can do that they can't do. Yeah. I, I wanted to move on a bit to um, to another topic that, that got a bit of an update. Um, the leadership team inside of the Dynamics 365 uh, suite. Uh, Charles mentioned some names. I think they're all they're all known uh, known product managers. Um, mm-hmm. Did any any of those names or or, cha- or changes surprise you? Yeah. Uh, no, not at all. No, it all makes sense to me. I, I mean, I know all those people he was talking about and the roles that they he's put them uh, into or that they're into now all seem to make perfect sense. Uh, you know, they're they're very smart. Uh, very smart about what they're Yeah, doing. I guess the one notable just as a change was Ray Smith, right? He had been, I had known him to join join Microsoft on the CRM side um, and he had been, so, yeah, and now he's, he's yeah. leading supply chain management. I mean, that is a big a big jump. I, I, I know he's also an experienced product manager um, type of type of role. So um, I'm sure it's not a, you know, not a problem or anything, but. Yeah, I think yeah. I, that one caught me a little bit uh, just because I didn't realize that that move had happened when uh, Charles uh, said that. But uh, having talked to Ray before uh, and, and knowing him, uh, I, I think it was a smart move. I think he'll you know, do some incredible things for them over on that supply chain side. It was interesting to me in the conversation about some of the things they seem very excited about. To me, seem very niche, but also very big companies, right? The, the, that supply stuff as well as the call centers. He's all excited about, you know, call centers or, or, or the new black or something. You know, <laughs> it just was a little surprising to me because, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think in my day to day about call centers because most of our customers that we're focusing on and dealing with don't really have you know, what you would consider call centers, but I guess it's, it's a very big business. And, uh, he was very excited about it, which tells me, you know, Microsoft gets excited. They go after something. Yeah. When you talk to Glow. So, when you talk to global SIs, problem. they certainly care a lot about big contact, big contact center deals and projects. Um, so yeah, I, I can yeah. certainly see why. And that's always, I think that's kind of always been the case. But uh, yeah, it's it's funny though because most people who aren't worrying about it day to day, you hear them get excited about it, and it doesn't doesn't really resonate. But but those are certainly big big deals. Well, you know, even even though I mean, when he talks to me and he he hears it's me on the phone, you know, he he. He kind of goes into okay, where do I, what do I want to target? Who do I want to target right. with this conversation? I'm sure it's not. I mean, he, he's got he probably even more so now. Uh, you know, he he's, he puts his focus into okay, who do I want to tickle with my words on this call? And uh, you know, call center was clearly you know aiming at enterprise folks that might listen. Mm-hmm. I don't blame him. I would too. And and you know, from what I've seen of. of- advances in that area over time i mean those are big investments too um and, and to your point i mean it's uh and yep. i think he's thinking enterprise i think he's also thinking you know inside the crm realm when he's talking to you um but uh mm-hmm. yeah I, I think supply chain is a is one where there's a, a, i think not I won't get too far into it but I, I think uh you know partners are asking a lot of microsoft on the supply chain side right now to really deliver like good solid improvements um so that, that is certainly a big a big challenging uh well, you know, a couple of things that you mentioned um, during the podcast as well kind of pertain to your experiences with with Power Platform, especially we talked a little bit about it, you know, and, and it gets back to me to this idea of, of what's a platform versus what's a business application. So when you're working with a prospect, are they coming to you thinking about a Power Platform or are they coming to you thinking we need to we need to better manage our our leads and our opportunities um, and, or do they, and do they care that, that this is Power Platform? I mean, all over the place. They're, they're, they're coming from, we need to manage our, our sales and service. And we see you guys have an app for that. And we feel like Dynamics is too big. Okay, fine. I'll just roll with that. They're coming to us with, we're looking at Dynamics 365, but we really don't have a sales or service issue. We're trying to solve other issues and then we'll talk platform. Um, so that they're definitely coming from all different directions, but. As I mentioned in the call with him, there's an awareness out, out there that there wasn't before. 
there seems to be an awareness that, I mean, I think people that knew what Dynamics 365 was didn't know what the Power Platform was, didn't realize Dynamics 365 was a great big app running on the Power Platform, and you could build your own app. Um, we did, um, but they can they can also build their own app to solve whatever kind of business problems. I mean, we got people on uh, on Rapid Start uh, continuously asking, "Can we do this? Can we do that with this? Can we do that? Or do we have to do Dynamics? Can that do it?" And I'm like, "Any of them can do anything." I mean, it, it's really true because that Power Platform just opens up. I mean, we've yet to run into a a scenario of a customer requirement, regardless of how abstract it was or odd it was, that, that wasn't able to be solved. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they had the budget to solve it, you know, because you still got to spend some money um, to build stuff, but the capabilities there. And I think that, yeah, people are starting to understand that. So we're getting, definitely getting more calls from people about, you know, we want more information about this power platform. But these are also, uh, a lot of these people are also looking at, you know, they're not budget holders. Uh, they don't have, they're not in a position to, you know, just sign up for an expensive uh, first party solution. They're not the right person for that, but they still got problems to solve. And before, frankly, before the power platform, that was it. I mean, if, you, if you're not going to buy dynamics from me to solve your whatever problem, then I have nothing to sell you. Um, so it's opened up a huge market that, that, uh, always existed they just didn't have a place to go get any solution to the problem um you you mentioned that you're also adapting the way you offer services so low code development um on a subscription basis is is part of that is that right yeah i mean i i've been kind of seeing the writing on the wall here for a while that uh you know several things were converging and the you know the advances that microsoft has made around low code no code I know a lot of partners were initially concerned that, oh my goodness, they're going to put us out of business because they're not going to need developers anymore. But we looked at it as, you know what, we're not going to need developers anymore, um, or at least not as many. And we need to really kind of pivot our workforce into uh, expert, you know, low-code, no-coders. Really more about, because, you know, it's low-code, no-code. It doesn't mean your mom can do it, right? You still need to, still need to know what you're doing. And a lot of customers, even though they're able to get in there and do stuff and, and make make something, they didn't make it the best way, and it's not solving the problem the way it, they intended. So there's still need for experts to come in who know that platform. And uh, I was looking back at a lot of our recent uh, customer projects and uh, how much develop what true development work uh, was involved, and in, in the the number was was just very small. And actually, my business partner and I, uh, Blood Saroff, have been talking for years about being able to offer a subscription, services as a subscription. But, you know, it's just going to be what? Customer support's about all you can do. But we really studied this thing hard a few months ago and decided, why couldn't we do deployment and customization and basically everything, uh, you know, on, on a subscription, you know? The most most expensive resource for a partner like us is developers, and they kind of you know they kind of mess up the map on any of these things. But you know, we're using them so infrequently, so yeah, we we decided to launch a a service subscription. You know, all you can eat deployment, customization, support, training, every, everything. And uh, so far, all of our customers just about have switched over to that model. So I'm feeling that I either didn't price it high enough. Or, uh, or something, we'll see. And even new customers that we talk to, you know, they kind of look at the, the price initially, uh, cause, you know, it's not cheap, cheap, but they look at the price initially, oh, that's kind of expensive. And I think, okay, thanks. And they'll, they'll call back about three or four days later and say, hey, we were kind of doing the math. And, uh, actually this isn't expensive. It's cheap. So I'm thinking, okay, definitely maybe price too low, but, uh, we'll see. I mean, we got, we got, uh, we're working, we're working through what that looks like because nobody's doing anything like that right now. Um, we're trying to identify where those potential risks are. But, uh, I mean, I talked to about with Charles about, it. he says, uh, internally they've been thinking, why aren't more partners doing something like this? So I'm thinking, okay, well, that's a good sign. Are you positioning it as an offering that goes along with your pre-built, pre-built solutions? 
whichever. I mean, we're, if they have Dynamics 365, that's fine. If they have Rapid Start, that's fine. You know, they need the same things. They really end up needing the same thing. Okay. So it doesn't matter to us. Um, but we've tried to wrap the whole platform into it because even somebody who's maybe trying to build some apps on their own, uh, you know, in Canvas, they don't know model driven or they don't know power bi or they don't know power automate or somebody who knows power automate doesn't know the others so uh, we tried to throw a blanket over all those things in the power platform and say you know we'll help you with all those things so i'm 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 pretty happy with the reaction so far Um, you know our prior model was blocks of hours which was also something that was kind of new at the time where people would pre-purchase a block of hours and then we just work with them against that block of hours. But what I was realizing was people were looking at that block of hours like a like a like an hourglass uh, and start getting panicky as it was getting, you know, <laughs> going down. And then they'd start kind of hoarding their hours. And I'm thinking, you know what, you're not getting out of this platform what is potential <laughs> for your business because you're too focused on the clock. So that was one of the things I liked about this this idea was it kind of took their eyes off the clock. So now, forget about the clock. What 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 are you what are you trying to solve? What what things you know, look here's this whole whole smorgasbord of stuff in the platform. You can use all of it, any of it, to solve every problem you've got, and you don't have to look at the clock. So yeah, I was pretty happy about about that. Now you know, just like everything else, is making sure people realize they're all looking for the gotcha. You know, oh, this is a uh, you just want to get us to sign up and then everything we ask for is going to be, you know, out of scope because uh, we do have, you know, code, true code development out of scope or customers that will say, well, we're going to need a lot of customizations. Yeah, well, customizations today doesn't mean code. Um, you know, it's, it's a very small percentage of the work we've done. We have the numbers to ourselves to prove it. We know, we know this is the case. So I'm uh, just getting everybody else to, to believe mm-hmm. that's the case. There must be some way to for you to sort of throttle uh the amount of work that's that's going to any one one client, though, right? If it's not ours, it's some other mechanism. Well, yeah, I mean, they, they get assigned a team, um, and for a basic thing, they've got a you know a customer service rep, their primary person they're talking to, who's backed by two technicians. So their the capacity is limited by what those three people can do. Um, you know, so they couldn't they couldn't very well say, "I want you to you know do a month uh, you know six months worth of stuff in this month because can't be done with their team. So there's a, I mean, it's unlimited up to the mm-hmm. capacity of those people, but I mean, they can work those people <laughs> like dogs. <laughs> ah, it's interesting. Um, all right. And, and yeah, it strikes me that one of the, the real things that enables this and, and if, and, and if it is really successful long term, it's because the, the, the ecosystem needs people who are really experts in what's possible in power platform and, and not only can build the things, but but know what can, like you were saying, know what can be built and what can't, um, just like any other sort of specialized skill out there. Um, sure, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, and, and you need those people to to do it, whether they're an internal team that you've invested in for expertise, or whether you're 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 going out to a to a firm like yours. Um, so it certainly makes sense. I think the other, the other thing that's new for people to realize that's kind of changed is. Uh, and, and a lot of people still feel like, well, we, we're going to build this thing. It's going to take, you know, two, three months, whatever it's going to take to build it. But then once it's built, we're, we're done. We don't really need to partner anymore because it's built. We're just going to use it. But uh, that's not the case anymore. I mean, we we get customers that had been on our hours model for years. I mean, we built the stuff initially, but then they keep discovering new things, adding new things, finding new problems to solve. And it, it doesn't it doesn't ever really end. Um, and I think that's a change because of the platform. Platforms opened up, you know, the ability beyond Dynamics 365 to solve all kinds of problems. They keep, like I mentioned, that addiction before. You know, they get addicted to some, you know, to having the problem solve, moving off some spreadsheet or something like that. And suddenly they're looking around the office at every spreadsheet they can find. So it, it continues. Yeah. This um, this also leads into one of the, maybe the final uh, thing I wanted to get your views on which was it's something i've actually been getting a lot of feedback on which was a recent podcast and and an article we ran uh talking about channel outlook based on some surveys and and some analysis done by the partner economics group um i think you've seen seen that piece and some of their 
predictions or some of the trends that they've that they've identified. Uh, just to mention a couple: decline in median services margin, decline in median software margins for partners in the Microsoft Channel. I think in, in um, you know weaker median revenue growth, decline in me- median. EBITDA. So, I mean, nothing great there <laughs> um, to, to really celebrate, but those are all medians. Um, and so the one thing I always think about is like, that's not, you know, it doesn't say anything about what's happening on both sides of it, um, of that middle point. Right. Um, but I, I don't know, what were your first, uh, first reactions in seeing that? Yeah. I mean, I've known Dana for a long time and, uh, he definitely drills into this stuff. Uh, I don't know his, uh, his partner, but I've known Dana for a long time and you know, he's not a doom and gloom guy, uh, you know. So when he, when the, you know, the information he's compiling results in, you know, unfavorable stuff, I don't look at it as oh, he's just, uh, you know, chicken little. Um, sky's falling. You know, he's because he's not a, a doom and gloom guy generally. Uh, so yeah, you got you got to look at that stuff and think about it. But as he's going through some of these bullet points, you know, you can look at it, you go, oh, that's that's not good, but you can see that it's completely logical. I think, you know, we've, and we I think we've mentioned this before. I don't think there's any surprise that partners are a uh, are the best and worst thing for Microsoft. Uh, you know, they Microsoft couldn't scale up large enough to take care of every customer, obviously. So they have to have partners, but partners frequently get in the way of sales, you know, cause they're coming in with some big, huge cost to deploy and suddenly the customer is not buying licenses. Um, and there goes the lost sale for Microsoft cause the, you know, the partner, you know, was coming in there with a high number and that's been a problem for Microsoft probably forever. So this idea of not, not necessarily moving the partner out of the equation, but certainly minimizing where they can. And our platform had a lot to do with that. I don't know how much of that was intentional aimed at that target, but certainly was a result that customers can do things now without a partner at all uh, that they never could have before. So when you look at, you know, decline in services margins and decline in, in that sort of stuff, that it's not surprising because a lot of stuff now is being done by customers themselves. Um, for us, that just means that you have to stop looking at it the way you've always looked at it because, you know, the world keeps moving and business has changed and you better change too or you're just going to sit there and cry in your soup because your margins could have a zero. Um, and you, you go where the customers are and the customers are, I mean, customers calling us today right out of their mouth, right? I mean, the first sentence out of their mouth is we don't want any code. Well, you know, for a partner who's made a living doing code, you know, forever, uh, this isn't a very good thing to hear. And I'm hearing it all the time, you know, and, and if you haven't pivoted your practice towards, you know, the low code, no code, and instead, you know, get customers because you've got expertise across that platform and not because you've got legacy knowledge of how to write code, uh, you're going to have a problem. And I think that's where a lot of this, you know, the people on the downside of that median are probably just kind of stuck, stuck in the, the, their old thinking, their old ways. Well, world has moved on yeah it's a it's a difficult situation for a lot of firms who you know where the business owners i think love have really love the way they run their businesses they love the the way they support customers and they sort of the older ways um and those had been profitable ways to do it that that aren't and that's a it's a, it's a major change um for, for a lot of those firms um and they'll have to decide how to how to adapt to it in one way or another i think yeah microsoft's Microsoft's incentives are changing, right? At the same time, to probably, and that probably explains a lot of, um, a lot of the risks that the partners are facing, and probably some of the performance dip too. Not all of it. Uh, yeah, I think the, the 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 generation that's coming into now is also not as afraid as the one before, so they're they're less apt to feel like oh, I got to get a partner to do this. They're more apt to think, well, you know. I know apps. I've had a phone since I was born, um, so they're 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 definitely not in, as intimidated as their predecessors were. Uh, more likely, I, I don't know that this this low code no code would have meant anything ten years ago. Nobody would have touched it. But as this uh, you know, new generation comes in, they're perfectly comfortable with uh, doing that sort of stuff. And I, I just think partners, maybe a lot of them, haven't really paid attention to the the new customer that we're talking to today. 
uh, that isn't scared, that isn't hiring you because they're they're fearful. You know, they're they're only going to hire you because you're bringing something to the table that they're not able to do, uh, not because they're scared. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a that's a big difference in mindset from the customer. One of the things I think is a real strength of of the approach that that you're taking um, and that other vendors are taking, where they're building on the power platform, is that they, you know, they are. It gets it gets a business farther away from being dependent on first party apps um, and the margins that go with them, and that and the deploy the sort of more rigid deployments that go with them. Um, when there's less, maybe less. Uh, was it less less uh, juice for every squeeze, <laughs> um, in, in that in that world, and where where it's at is industry focused solutions, um, you know segment you know solutions to meet specific segments. Cost, I think, cost makes a big difference too. I mean, we we built an app that runs on a five dollar license from Microsoft, and our app is free. So, I mean, to be able to get a CRM that works with all your Microsoft stuff, that you can manage your you know, your prospects, opportunities, and, and, and cases for, for five bucks a user is, is unheard of. I don't think you can get that, anything like that anywhere else, anywhere. Yeah. So that's probably, I mean, that's why we got, we got about 90,000 users of that app uh, and continuing to grow. And most of them are, you know, coming in because it doesn't cost them anything and they're not going to be potential customers for us, but, you know, they're, they're still, they're, it, it reduces their risk significantly of trying to solve a problem on the platform if they're trying to solve it on a five dollar license and if they're trying to solve it with a 65 or 95 so i think unless they've got some needs that are very specifically met by the first party apps or their big company you know and they've got lots of needs like that then uh we're seeing that shift and it's that same generation i was just talking about too that's there you know they're they're building their own stuff and they get stuck we hope they call us uh, they don't necessarily always call us, call on other partners, call on whoever, and they didn't lock the thing up. So that's just kind of the risk we take. Um, how has that transition been? Because that was a change of direction somewhat for you, right? Yeah, we did that, uh, oh, I guess it's probably been a year and a half, maybe two years ago now. You know, we we launched Rapid Start with this idea because we were, you know, we were all in on Microsoft's partner message that you need to build repeatable IP. And we had that IP and thought, okay, let's let's uh, let's launch it out there. And we launched it for I don't know twenty bucks a month per user. And at the time we did that, it sat on top of the Dynamics, uh, which at the time I think was forty four bucks. So it was a pretty expensive proposition to get your Dynamics knocked down to something simple, it's like you're paying a premium to have mm-hmm. less. Uh, but it was still moving. And then, uh, you know, when they separated the platform from the first party, that gave us the opportunity to kind of move off the top of Dynamics and down next to it. Um, and, and things were going along well. I mean, we were, I was, my, you know, I had that dream that I was going to, to just live off of uh, recurring uh, subscription revenue on a beach somewhere drinking margaritas. But uh, everybody still wanted customizing. So I couldn't get out of the customization business, even though I tried very hard. Um, so we continued working with customers, customizing, and I, I was looking at the numbers uh, at some point in the past and realized we were we we're still doing far better on customization of Rapid Start than we were on the subscription revenue. And it just seemed like a logical thing. Well, let's just make it free. I mean, let's see if we can't get it into a lot more hands that will lead to a lot more customization work. Uh, and that, that's exactly what happened. And then now that's led to this subscription model. So... I've made, mm-hmm. I've made a few mistakes uh, in my business career, but I haven't made too many here at Microsoft so far. All right, that's really interesting. Um, and you know, the other thing I, I wonder more broadly with with these sort of changing, you know, opportunities in in the channel is how many, you know, entrepreneurs, especially like you said, younger uh, entrepreneurs who haven't haven't been hardened in the partner the partner game. Um, might look at the the partnership model with Microsoft and say, you know, we could just be a consultancy. Um, we can be experts in Power Platform. We could be experts in you know whatever uh, customer service or field service or whatever. But we don't need to sell. We don't need to sell licenses. We can build up our expertise, build up our reputation, get some real successes, impress people, and and just work that way and let other let other let these older uh, 
older businesses, uh, older owners fight for fight for the mar- uh, you know, license margin? Yeah, you know, we kind of we ended up jumping out of that game because once we moved off of the first party licenses down to the power platform, and then they lowered the price of that to like five bucks a user. There's frankly not any margin in it. You know, to sell to sell you a, a half a dozen uh, five dollar licenses is yeah. thirty dollars a month. How much could I possibly get in margin on thirty dollars a month? You'd have to have millions of licenses to have it be worthwhile. So for us. You know, customers are always calling, hey, can I add a user? Can I remove a user? So it just wasn't worth it for us. So we just bowed out of the licenses entirely. Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, most of the traditional partners weren't focused on those low-cost licenses. The opposite, you know, they focused on the, the higher-cost licenses because they have reasonable enough margins, even though those are diminishing. Um, and I know, uh, you know, there's been fear about the direct selling by Microsoft. Well, that's been there for a very long time. Um, but I think, you know, as Microsoft continues to scale up that engine, you know, customers are asking, why, why do I need to buy licenses from you? Why can I just buy them here? What, what, what's, and partners are kind of fumbling a little bit, I think, for a good explanation other than, well, it gives you, you know, one source of billing or something like that. You know, so I, I think a lot of this new generation of customers coming into Microsoft and then getting a call from a partner and saying, why do you exist? I don't understand. Yeah. I don't understand what your role is in this whole thing. You know, what, what, why are you here? Yeah, that's that's one of the big that's one of the big challenges for the for the foreseeable future here. Uh, very real one. Uh, all right. Excellent. Well, anything else you wanted to mention? Any other uh, takeaways from from? your conversation with Charles that we didn't touch on here or, 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 or things you're looking forward to? Uh, no, I think you, I think we've covered a lot of it. I am looking forward to playing around with uh, Viva Sales, even though I can't play around with it on Rapid Start yet. But knowing that it's coming, you know, uh, soon to the platform, uh, I want to I want to certainly get an understanding and expertise in that product. We're in a pilot now, and uh, that'll, that'll be out there, you know, pretty soon. And I think that's one to watch. Uh, if Charles says it's one to watch, it's because he's, you know, he knows what's happening behind the curtain on it. Um, and I, I, I think that's going to be one for people to keep an eye on. All right. Very- and, you know, if you, if you may want to follow me, I'll, I'll continue blogging as I always have. I mean, I kind of openly blog about our business, uh, you know, models and, you know, success and things that are working, things that aren't. I mean, I did a big post all about why we're doing this, uh, services subscription um you know i think it's i think it's going to be a a very common model in the near future um and i'll keep posting about you know things we're running into as we as we roll that thing out uh the the challenge around people is a challenge for all of us you know uh one of the upsides of the of this model is uh we don't have any trouble finding people because uh you know they're not uh, gauged by the clock anymore we used to in our hours model, you know, uh, people were tied to those hours and they were tied to trying to upsell more hours at the end and make sure that customers, you know, that, that, so they were kind of under some stress there. And, uh, you know, now they really don't have any stress, right? Just go make that customer as happy as you possibly can in your 40 hours a week. Um, and, and that's, 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 so we're not having trouble, as much trouble finding people as some of the others, but we're competing now with customers for those people. Um, you know, a lot of customers out there thinking, I'm, I should hire a partner. I'll just hire a person. Uh, so we're competing with them for those resources. So I think that's going to continue to be a challenge. But I wouldn't, and I think I said this on this show even a couple of years ago. I said, I don't think I want to be a developer right now. Um, and and I, I, I'd still say that. I mean, unless you're working for a software company building their software, I think that the uh, developer role in a customer environment is, is, is smaller than the number of developers we still have out there. Yeah, I think you mentioned this somewhere, but the idea of um, you know a new role, a new defi- a new title for some of these people, um, and doing new work is is very much a, a possibility in the future. Something like I used to have a role like a system, like a application engineer rather than a developer, um, where you're. Yeah, yeah, I got to come up with something. Less you're still doing. <laughs> I mean, we still got a couple. We still got a couple of them because you know the need still arises. I mean, 
you can build a lot of stuff with low code, but sometimes you'll realize, you know what, low code's going to require 27 low code steps, or I can a developer knock this out in five minutes. Um, you know, so you got to look at economics sometimes. Low code isn't always the most economical solution. But then again, something that developer built might be this little black box in your environment that you don't want to have either. Um, so there's there's still a, there's still a need for for uh, developers. It's just not as strong as it was before. Nobody can deny that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and there's, I mean, there's there's software coming out left and right. I mean, there's I think there's lots of development work out there. Just doesn't necessarily match this um, this area uh, as well as it used to. Well, and everything, everything aimed at customers is all low code, no code now. That's all you hear from many platforms. Yeah, I, I mean, no analysts code. and, and, and uh, you know, sort of business uh, strategy firms have, have, have the low code <laughs> opportunity in their teeth as well. I'm certainly seeing more of that too, just external to, to this channel, right? But to your point, to make something low code required a lot of development. <laughs> but it yeah. required a lot of development at the company yeah. that's producing the software, not at the customer who's going to use yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, how much did James, James Phillips used to talk about how how large his team had grown? And I assume some of that was investment in, in many more developers over, over the years. Oh, yeah. So It takes a lot of developers to make something low code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt. A bunch of traders, I'm sure, to their brethren. <laughs> Well, uh, this is, as, as always, Steve, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun uh, catching up with you. Uh, we'll definitely keep our eye on your your blog, your can, your candid uh, reporting on, on what you're up to is always appreciated. Good for catching up. Good, good catch up. This has been another episode of the MSDW podcast. My thanks once again to Steve for joining. We posted a link in the show notes to Steve's interview with Charles Lamana and our earlier episode on the channel Outlook from Partner Economics that we also discussed. If you want to get in touch with me, reach out by email, jgumpert at msdynamicsworld.com. And for all of our updates, please do follow us on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Until next time, this is MS Dynamics World, signing off.